When a disease breaks out in a developing country, they may not have the funds to stop it before it spreads and becomes a pandemic. That's why in 2017, the World Bank started selling something called pandemic bonds. Here's how they're meant to work. Investors buy the bonds paying into a pot of money. Donors from the international community pay the investors interest every month. That's how they make a profit. And it's a lot, as much as 11% per year. After three years, if there hasn't been a big outbreak, they get their original investment back. But if there is an outbreak, that money goes to developing countries that need help containing it. The World Bank, which is supposed to be about developing societies and fighting poverty around the world. The World Bank is an international organization. We were set up in 1944. We're one of the so-called Bretton Woods organizations, along with the IMF. And we have 189 member governments. And we do have a very ambitious mission, which is set out in what we call our twin goals, which is to end extreme poverty and to boost shared prosperity globally. One of the ways that it thinks that you fight epidemics is the creation of special bonds called pandemic bonds. And pandemic bonds are loans that are sold to investors, sold to pension funds, sold to hedge funds. And they pay a return to those big investors until a pandemic happens. And when the pandemic happens, the original capital that was invested in the bond, that is used to help countries deal with that pandemic. The problem is that in order to encourage big investors to buy these bonds, they've been structured in such a way that they don't really work at all. They've effectively never paid out to date. Despite the Ebola crisis and whatever else, they've never paid out. Now with coronavirus, pandemic bonds have finally been triggered. So we hope now that those bonds are gonna pay out. However, these bonds have been paying out high rates of interest for the entire time that they've been issued to rich investors. So a lot of people have made money. It would be far, far better if we put society's resources into trying to take money out of tax havens, tax the super rich, tax big business, Business, so that countries are able to develop decent, universally accessible public healthcare systems so that when something like this happens, they have a head start. They're ready to begin dealing with a public health crisis in a way that can actually meet the needs of everybody, but especially those who are going to struggle otherwise. So it's basically a gamble. Investors buy in, betting that a pandemic won't happen. Now it has. COVID-19 has infected more than a million people globally. Nearly every country in the world has cases, but none of them has seen a dime from the pandemic bonds. That's because the bonds were designed to entice investors. They have a ton of rules that lower the risk of a payout, specifically 386 pages of fine print. Before the bonds can be paid out, 12 weeks have to have passed since the beginning of an outbreak. Given how drastically the situation can change within a single week, that's a long time to wait. And after that, there's still more waiting. The World Bank needs to work out whether the conditions for the payouts have been met, which can take another couple of weeks. The bank has set a high bar though. It's so high in fact, that since they were issued, pandemic bonds have never been paid out. Even the 2018 Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the second worst outbreak of the disease in history, wasn't enough to trigger them. In the case of COVID-19, if the bonds are eventually distributed, the nations waiting for the much needed assistance will find their crises may have gotten exponentially worse. The idea that you can kind of persuade the financial market to behave as if it was a development institution, as if it was something that was interested in solving poverty around the world is ludicrous. And we shouldn't tie ourselves up in knots like this. We need to tax and we need to regulate and we need to build up decent public services. I always like to think that after the Second World War, my grandparents' generation suddenly thought We've been through this war, we've been through horrendous suffering, we want to build a better society, how do we do that? And one of the things they did in this country was to say, healthcare is too important to be dictated by the market. Whether I get treated or not, how much I suffer or not, should not depend upon how much money I've got in my bank account. Healthcare should be a given. It should be available to everybody in society, no matter where they come from. And that's where they created the National Health Service. And it was a very effective way of trying to re-level some of the inequalities that had evolved in society over a long period of time. And I think most people in Britain probably regard the National Health Service as kind of the pinnacle of civilization of what if we put our minds to it we can achieve to create a better way of living. Exactly that kind of solution needs to be rolled out right the way around the world today. Unfortunately the very institutions like the World Bank that are creating these ridiculous pandemic bonds have spent years and years and years telling countries they need to slash public spending, they need to privatize everything in sight, they need to liberalize their economies. They've made those kind of solutions that much more difficult and we 
need to reverse course now very, very rapidly. And hopefully one of the few positives that might come out of this crisis is that we finally wake up to the damage that's been done to our ability to meet our needs as human beings by the ravages of the market for, for decades now. The public and private sectors must work together. We have good examples from the past year. In our collaboration with Facebook, Google, and the world's major media platforms to fight misinformation, in the collaborations to develop and approve safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines fast and distribute them fairly, and in our creation of the Solidarity Response Fund and the WHO Foundation innovative efforts to mobilize support from the private sector for pandemic response and global health. We will work with a member government that wants to transfer some of its natural disaster risk to the markets, and we can do that in reinsurance or cat bond form. Oh, that, that makes sense, but, but cat bonds, where do cat bonds come in? I thought that cat bonds are a, a form of insurance. So why would uh, a government need to buy insurance? Yeah, one thing that is very important at the World Bank, of course, is resilience. We are always working with our member governments to build their financial resilience. And natural disasters not only create humanitarian crises with deaths and loss of property, uh, but also financial crises many times in our, in our member governments because the fiscal uh, impact of a natural disaster can be extreme and can in fact set back development gains significantly as governments start reallocating money that they would otherwise spend on health, education, to rebuilding infrastructure that's been damaged. So we believe it's very important with our member governments that they handle that risk uh, early before it happens and engage in proper risk management when things are still uh, good in the country. So what our governments really need is quick dispersing and clear uh, amounts that will be paid in the case of an event. So that's why we've been using parametric uh, transactions for, uh, for the uh, uh, cat bonds we've been issuing. Great, and from an investor's perspective, that's good too, because there is a, a quick and objective settlement uh, following, following any event, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. The whole issues of uh, collateral being held for a long period of time and loss creep really don't appear in our transactions because of the nature of the triggers we're using, the, the parametric triggers. That's super interesting, so um, super interesting.